Welcome to Showbiz Chicago, the Chicago Pride Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Roberts. And my God, I have one of my favorite people with me today. I've been wanting to meet him and interview him for many a year. Of course, everybody knows him from The Tonight Show. And he's got a fantastic new book called Man Up. And he is also going to be at the fabulous Park West on May 28th. Of course, it's Mr. Ross Matthews. Welcome. I'm so happy to talk to you. Hi. Hi. So I know you're on a train. You're on a train going to Washington. I take it it's Washington D.C. Yeah, uh, I'm just leaving New York, where we just had um, a big book launch. Everything in my opening night of a big one-man show. It's been out on TV to do it. I'm so excited. I can't tell the author. It's just horrible. Wow. So, so tell me, Ross, why a book? But, you know, I've lived this ridiculous life where I mean, it's things have happened and it started in a little farm town in Washington State. I've gotten to, like, live every dream that I've ever dreamt of living in the middle of Hollywood. And all the while, I was thinking to myself, do I write a book one day? And what was the process like? Because, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that have written their, their life stories and it can be quite painful at times. You know, it was very... Difficult and personal. Yeah, I wrote like a treatment, which is the first few, a couple of chapters. And I didn't know what I was doing. Who knows how to write a book? I did, I've never done it. So I um, I just wrote it, and I, it felt very natural to just be a storyteller. And Chelsea took a look at that treatment, and she said, I want to publish this book. I believe in this book. And then I was freaked out because I'm like, now it's going to be really good. <laughs> she more than So I was like, okay, this is a whole new level. So I spent a good year and a half. Why she went to the book, and I took it very, very seriously. You know, there was there was stories that didn't go in your book. There was like, uh, uh, there was no alter. Just for this reason, we have title the book is Man Up, and I define Man Up as you are what you are. Celebrate what makes you different. People waste so much time looking at. So there's that positivity, that message, woven throughout all these stories, and that was the important thing to do. So tell me about growing up, Ross, and 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 having to uh, and. It sounds like your childhood was, was much like mine. I, I worked at Lane Bryan too, believe it or not. <laughs> you did not. You did not. I did in the in the Summit Park Mall in Niagara Falls, oh, New York. Oh, that's hilarious! I know. You're mean and old too. I know. When I saw that in your book, it's like I didn't even know Lane Bryan's were outside of like <laughs> this side of New York. So thank God. That's hilarious. Well, I, I had a great childhood. I mean, I, my parents were really open-minded and loving, and, and uh, I was exposed to a lot of different, you know, I lived in a very small farm town, so we, we were like hunting, and I, I worked in the fields, and it's a very different life that I live now, but I'm just so grateful for my upbringing, and, and uh, I really was, I'm one of the lucky ones. And, well, yes, but, but you've also, you've also seemed to always have had a goal, according, you know, and Things don't just happen, but things kind of did happen for you. <laughs> In the oddest I've always, felt, I've always felt like, um, it's not even motivated. It's just it's like, of course, you know, you work hard, you set a goal, you work hard, you, you work hard, you settle, and how you achieve it. It just, I wouldn't even call it motivated. It's just it's a no brainer for me. That's how I wire. And so I just have never stopped. I will never stop. And uh, it's always just about, Achieving. It's not even about success, it's about achieving for me. So, talk to me about just the art of comedy and and what it means to you and what what do you think makes somebody funny? Well, I think... Oh, shoot. Are you there? I'm here. Okay, good. Well, so, you know I am on a train. We're going through a tunnel. Right now we're at a station, so I hope you can still hear me. Is this still good? Still good, my friend. Okay, good. And by the way, this is how you know we're doing it for real. Comedy, I think, is one of those things you either have or you don't. It's one of, one of the few skills that it's almost impossible to learn. You know, timing and rhythm and all of the music and comedy. And then there's just this, like, especially with what I do, it's like so much uh, spontaneity. You just have to trust yourself to go like on autopilot in the zone kind of thing. And 
my kind of point of view, and that's what comedy is, that's what Rick gets really good at, from a point of view, is always to try and to, like, not be horrible. I try not to have a victim at the end of my joke. So be right. funny and be a human point of view. So how did you use comedy um, when you were in your childhood and, you know, finally to coming to terms with your sexuality? Well, you know, everything's got to be funny. If you don't laugh a thousand times a day, you're doing something wrong. And so, uh, I, and of course, there were trials growing up in a little farm town. But, you know, I used comedy as a control spot with people that necessarily I wouldn't have bonded with on other, you know, without comedy. And it was, it was almost like my, not shield, but my weapon. You know, it was like, if somebody screwed with me, I know I could either cut them down or make them laugh. And uh, then I did that with comedy. And then, then suddenly we were on the same level again. Yeah, it kind of, it kind of is a leveler, isn't it? Because really good comics are much smarter than the, than the people that come after us, I think. Well, if you have a disadvantage in someone else's eyes, I think comedy can be the, the common denominator. Right. You know, and it can get you back on the same playing field. Right. And you know, Russ, it really is the last bastion of free speech. Oh, so long. Oh, my God. You think it is the last bastion? You know what? It kind of is, isn't it? Because it is. You can say horrible, horrible things and say, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, I, was, um, I was at a show recently, Russ, at... Um, at Second City, and you know, there was a comedy troupe there, and you know it was almost gay bashing. But, but in the same token, you know, for what they do and for what they have to come up with, you know, sometimes they took the easy way out. But it's still, for any of the art forms out there, the freest. That's true. That's true. And it should be. I mean, it should be that the comics get trouble at times. You know, sometimes you just, like I said, that zone that I'm talking about where you trust yourself. Right. Uh, it can get you in the tight situation, but comedy is a, is a, um, a shield, you know, you can, uh, you can get away with more. So tell me about the evolution of your of yourself from, you know, your long-term relationship in high school with a woman and then going to college and mm-hmm. getting the Tonight Show. You know, what kind of... Um, like growing up and, and becoming a man when you're manning up, you know, what were some of the, what, who were some of the mentors and what were some of the experiences you had that said, hey, here's mama? Well, you know, I, it's sort of, it's, I don't have to spend title of my book, it's Delusion of Self Confidence. And I just sort of always had it. Um, and but as I've grown older and, you know, become an adult, I, I understand how that impacted me, and I also, now with writing a book, I understand how, and I'm hearing from people, how it impacted them. And there is such a power and a strength in never apologizing for who you are, or really owning it, and saying, I, you, you may have an issue with me, yes, but I love me, and I'd rather be me. There's such a strength in that. And, of course, this book is not a self-help book, you know. I don't claim to know something that other people don't. It's just how I live my life, and I know how it's affected my life, those kind of decisions. And in terms of mentors, I mean, uh, I have mentors in my life, like my partner, my mom, my father was a huge mentor. But in show business, of course, Chelsea and Jay Leno. Right. My life, my, my life before Jay and after, before Chelsea and after Chelsea. It was a big turning point, major pivot in my career. Not my career, because I have you know, I reaped the benefits of the success. It came from appearing on their shows. It also affected my confidence. So what do you think it was, Ross, that when you first went out on The Tonight Show, well, first of all, t- tell me how that actually happened. Because I really want to go into what is a day like for an intern at The Tonight Show. But you took that <laughs> two steps further, and look at you now. So what was a typical know, day you know, like? I, I would, you know, drive two hours in the morning. The, right, my college was in the end of the fire, so you could trust me with a couple hour drive. And I'd work for eight hours and drive two hours home. And then I'd have class from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. at night. And at, when I was an intern there, I would just make coffee, and cake, beer, get lunches. I mean, there was no sitting, running around constantly. 
but I loved it. And it, it showed me, like, the show is rope. I, I got to know how the people in the prop department work. Cue cards, lighting, the people who pull the curtain, uh, the producers, the writers, the PA, it, 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 it showed me from the bottom up how a TV show is put together. Wow. And what do you think right now is the biggest misconception people have about Jay Leno? Um, I, I, I would rather not, like, I, I don't even want to speculate on that, but what I do want to say is that from someone who's up close, I can tell you exactly in real life as he is on TV, and you're so consistently kind and consistently nice. Um, That's what everybody says. He's the kindest to person. Right. That's what everybody says. He's the kindest man. He is the kindest man. And of course, there's going to be negativity out there about everybody, but I can only tell you what I observe and what I know. And, and, and he's like, don't worry, you know, he came to my big book party, Target, to a book party for me. And he got up on stage and said, if he didn't have any children, if he did, he'll care. It's not just like me. And it was like the nicest thing. <laughs> wow. So, I know. Wow. I, I know. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, they're such humanitarians, I guess. And you know what? It, it, even in the comic industry, though, Ross, comedians help each other, too. I mean, that's always been kind of the standard play of it. So... You know, I found that to be true. There's always been that reputation that comics don't. They aren't, I mean, you do run across those kind of comics who are insecure and don't let other people shine. But in my experience, especially with Chelsea, with uh, Jay, with all the comics on Chelsea Show, Josh Wolf, Heather McDonald, Sarah, Chris, Fortune, all of us, we really rise up and, and help each other and, and help each other shine. I, I'm so lucky. I know. I know how lucky I am. Right. So what do you think it was about yourself, Ross, that, that you connected with the Tonight Show audience and the viewers, the, the millions and millions and millions of viewers? What, what was the hook, do you think? Well, you know, on paper, it shouldn't have worked. You know, this gay cartoon of a person <laughs> putting them, dropping them in the middle of these fancy red carpets and expecting it to work or sending you to the audience to, to love it. It, sh it shouldn't have worked. People should have looked at it and thought, what the hell is this? But it did. And I think why it did is, I think why it did is because it was so authentic. And, and, and again, and not to shoot my tutor, but like, you know, I delivered, but it was funny. My goal, I knew they would laugh at me at first, but I knew I would get them to laugh with me by the end. And if I could do that, I'd get another segment. In the early days, that's what it was. It was, it was from by segment to segment. There was no contract, there's nothing. It was just, if one segment worked, I'd get another one. Wow. Well, and you, you've set the standard now for interns because. <laughs> because it's definitely a connection when I go to any business and I need an intern. It's like, you work hard, you never know what could happen, there's definitely a connection. Mm -hmm. So what was it like being around such an institution like The Tonight Show and all the people you got to meet come through there? Well, you know, it's the best of the best. I, I started, you know, I, I started at the bottom of the totem pole with the best of the best and then had this media crisis, you know, on the top, working, you know, uh, on camera. And they really were my crash course in television production, these people that are, you know, my lifelong friends now. And as I have gone on, and I, you know, it's not just not sure, but as I work in the industry, I realize more and more how, how great they are. And, and I realize kind of how great I am because of what I learned from them. And I'm lucky enough that the Chelsea people are the best of the best as well now. And, you know, you work in other productions and you see, like, well, that's not how you should do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not. Um, you know, it's invaluable to me, and I'm like, you know, I keep working in television because I still feel like I get up when my talk show starts in the fall. If I start this picture, I know how I know how it's to be done, and I know the right way to do it, and I think that's why it'll be successful. Well, well, tell us about your talk show. And what's the format, and what station? It's going to be on E. It starts in the fall. Chelsea's producing it, and you know, I I've always wanted a talk show, and we were in E. And when I started thinking about people, what kind of talk show do I want to make? I looked at the landscape of how they do it. I how many talk shows that tear down pop culture, just they have to do that and that ridiculous. But I love it, and I think people love it. I want to create a forum for, for us to 
celebrate it, you know? Not that she can be like, dirty, like, they, I care about this stuff. So when I have fun, I'll drop the show, or I'll you her. And then, we'll go to the audience, the audience can ask the question. I mean, like, we can move from wherever to ask their question. It's a place for pop culture and people to be. Wow. Yeah, you know, I, I would, I would, I would love to do something, Ross, like the Graham Norton show here. In the oh States. yes, great right. kind of fun. And how interactive he is. You know, he's an inspiration, of course. He's an inspiration. Oh, Jim Donald, inspiration. Jim Lennon, Jockey. And now we get. I'm all fresh there. I come from them all. So, how did you and Chelsea become friends, and and what is that? How does that relationship grow and mature? What, what yeah, we like started together. We mentioned it years ago. Um, I was uh, traveling and doing some comedy clubs, which I hated doing. I just felt like comedy clubs. But I met her, and she was, we were both kind of like, we're just on a different level. She was like, so funny and so mean. And I was like, this is like, so hard to get clown. And she, we both are each other, we're ridiculous. We just hit it off right away. Why she wasn't really me? She's like, the most generous person I've ever met. And when she got her show, uh, she asked me to be on it, and she thought it was funny, and she took me along with her meteoric crazy life that she had. And now, what's so, what's so great about her is that her philosophy is that everyone can win. She helps them all. She produces projects with just about uh, every regular round table person on there. Um, you know, to different levels of success, but I mean, she's publishing my book. She's producing my talk show. And she, she, she could have just won by herself. And she's taken all of us with her in it. But I'll be eternally grateful. I feel like I'm talking so quiet and low, but I feel like everyone on the train is listening to me. <laughs> They're all staring at you, Ross. Uh, Isn't that funny? <laughs> Not that they can't who I am, but just like, we're going off for being so quiet. <laughs> you know what? You should set up a little podium at the front of the train and just sell books. <laughs> just like it's all the learning and exactly. So, how long is your comedy tour going on for? Uh, it goes on for uh, the first leg of it will go on until like the first week in June. I'm traveling all over the country, and I'm going from you know, DC, and then I go to Toronto, to Boston, and then um, I do a West Coast swing through LA, and then I go to Seattle, and I do Atlanta, Miami, Chicago, Philadelphia. There's so much fun to me with people connected, especially when it's so personal, to hear people's reactions firsthand about what they feel. Because this is my life, you know. The tales of the book are really about me and connecting me, connecting it. It's super rewarding. And, and you're going to end up being a mentor to many young gay men growing up. I mean, it's the circle of life. It just is. I was going to be a guest on Leno on Monday, and... Uh, Talking about the book that I wrote about my time there, it's really phenomenal, sort of how it all has gone down. What, what was the hardest part of the book to write, Ross? Say that one more time for me. What was the hardest part of the book to, you know, finalize and write? Maybe not just emotionally, but just, you just couldn't get through it and then finally, oh, that's the key. Um, you know, there was none of it. All of it was difficult. <laughs> All of it was difficult, but also so fun and so rewarding. But there was never a time that I couldn't get through something. I mean, the thing is, I wasn't making this up as I was going along. So it's not that I had to, like, speak up the perfect ending. I just had to tell the story. But I had to tell it, of course, in a very funny way. Right. And I just, I'm really proud of it. You know, like, I think that book is the best thing I've ever done so far. So how are you juggling everything nowadays with traveling, the book, a relationship? Has it been difficult, or is it kind of easy to easy? No, it's, it's difficult, and, and it, but it, it, you'll never hear me complain. You know, it's been a dream, a lifelong, forever dream, is to do this. So it, it's hard, and it's early morning, and it's late night, and it's interviews on the phone while you're on the train, and uh, not a lot of downtime, but I really believe in it. I'm so proud of it. If I wasn't proud of it, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I'm looking like, oh, I didn't see this book was. So worth talking about. I wouldn't be traveling in the country to spread the word. I'm so proud of it. And it's, it's so fun to do this. And it's, but it is very relatable. I mean, 
the stories are humorous and people are relating to that humor, but still it's so moving. And just the connection is just amazing that people make. And it's just, not just gay people, but just adolescents. hard letting go though isn't it when you're that invested especially when it's your own story but just like a player exactly. anyway, you know when you put that much time into it it's like all right it's finally done finally finally out and it's been so overwhelming you know hearing the reading the response which is so great so hi mike oh, great. i'm sorry to jump in we have time for one more question okay diane um okay. Well, well actually look how fancy i am i, I know my oh, my little diane uh, <laughs> You're managed. You love being managed. So, uh, well, I guess in closing, what, you know, everybody come out and see your, your fantastic show on the 28th. What do you want people to walk away What do you want your audience members to walk away with after they see your comedy show? Well, I want three things. I want them um, to have a good time. I want them to have, like, a fighting for laughing. <laughs> And I want them to think, to like relate to something in their life, a time when, when they either did you know, celebrate what makes them different or didn't, and try to do it the next time. Because that, that, is, that is the ultimate message. I think about my kids reading this book. And, and I hope that when they, whatever, whatever they are, whoever they are, they are themselves 100%. And I hope that the people come away with. Now there's an answer. Now you're making me cry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, you won't be on. Are you, you going to come to the show in the in whatever date it is? I forget. Uh, it's on May. It's on May, May 28th at the Park West, and I don't know if you performed at the Park West before, but it's one of the best venues in Chicago. It's, it's you know, and I've never really spent time in Chicago. I was only for layovers. Can you believe that? And my, I've been everywhere in the country. I've never spent time in Chicago. So I'm just showing you. Well, you will have a fantastic time. We'll show you around. Well, and everybody come and say hi. I want to meet everybody at the show, okay? They will be there. They will be there. Like, I, I heard tickets are selling very well, actually, so... Oh, great. Well, come give me a big hug when, uh, when we're there, okay? I absolutely will. And... And remember, get off the train. Don't rain on my parade. Don't tell me not to fly. I'm simply going to Don't tell me because I will do it. Right. Thank you, Ross Matthews. Thank you so much. See you soon.